Okay, so on the question of coffee, we we have um, we have mug business to deal with. Mm. Commemorative coffee, it's the best. Um, all right, just to start off with, we have this beautiful mug, which finally arrived um, only yesterday. Okay, so I don't know what happened. They really punished me. <laughs> with Matt Delmont's mug because of my copyright infringement on this one. So the first one we have to deal with, now you guys haven't actually seen this in person. Now I know I have to get my head out of the way. Right. Mayor White and um, Ellen Jackson at Freedom House uh, in 1975. Uh, and then in the back, um, we've got uh, an, the soiling of old glory. I'm not doing a very, is it focused? Yep. Soiling of old glory. We have, um, Michael Dukakis, Ellen Jackson, and Paul Parks. And we have a scene from Charlestown. Um, so it's, it's really, it's a real, and it's a two-tone. So it's a really good one. Um, so now I, I wrote down everybody who gave me the right answer this week, um, but then I left it on a card in my office. So based on, on what I think is I have, and I, anybody who gave the answer, was, did I miss a Jack joke? Jake's much ado about nothing. Much, great. I don't, I don't get it, Jack. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to go back and uh, I'm gonna have to go back and and uh, try and absorb that one. Um, in um, yes, so I have and, and if you emailed me the right answer, I said yes, right answer. So tell me if I'm missing someone. And somebody put it on the discussion board. And I'm trying to come remember who that was. And I wrote it down the person's name and then erased it right away so everybody wouldn't see it in reply. Who who wrote the answer on the um, on my announcement? I think I did. Anna, okay, all right. You're just giving it away. <laughs> all right, so that's the one I was missing. So I have Anna Riley, Gabe Levine, Ryder Bishop, Hunter Rodriguez, and uh, Anna Yerksa. Did I pronounce that right? How do you pronounce, Anna, how do you? Yeah, oh, yeah you pronounced it right. It's Yerksa. Um, so did I miss anybody whom I wrote back? You got the right answer? No? All right, so we we're gonna have a battle. I mean, there's no choice. Um, I'm out, as you know, I'm out of children, so you know all of their numbers. So, um, I will say this, it, it is a hockey player, uh, one to 99, Anna Riley. Um, 45. 45. Gabe. I'm going four. Four. Ryder. Uh, let's go, uh, 66. 66. Hunter. 67. Bobby Orr, there you go. 67. That was, hold on, Hunter, you said 67? Yes. Anna Yerksa. Uh, 68. 68. Okay, first of all, I skipped right past the important part, which is the answer. Okay, so th the question was, um, in the 1975 um, education bill, a Senate an amendment was added that passed um, uh, that was an anti-busing amendment, right? That stated in order to receive uh, federal funds uh, for the education funds, right? School boards could not place students according to race. It was intended to, to block uh, uh, efforts at busing. Right, and the question was, who wrote that amendment? And the answer was, Joe Biden. Joe Biden. That's right. Joe Biden authored offered that uh, authored that amendment, and this was an important part of his Senate career um, when he realized that his Delaware constituents really did not like the idea uh, of um, the integrated, you know, efforts to integrate the school boards, uh, especially through busing. He began, became, became um, a staunch uh, anti-busing uh, advocate, um, going up against even many moderate Republicans who had uh, come around to the idea, including uh, Massachusetts' own um, moderate, moderate Republican who uh, was um, uh, an advocate of, um, 
uh, busing as a form of integration. So that was a part of that's part of um, Joe Biden's past, and that's that is the answer. Okay, so now we, you know, get the educational part out of the way. That's important. Uh, okay, I think that, and the questions are forty five. Four, sorry, the answers are forty five, four, sixty six, sixty seven, and sixty eight. And I will tell you, this is the first time we have had it that somebody got it bang on. So I'm really impressed. It was not, Matt, it was not number four Bobby Orr um, because, of course, I'm not a Bruins fan. <laughs> um, and we've been mostly going with, with you know, players from um, my childhood and youth. And this is one as well. And I tell you that this is a player. So the answer is Anna Yorksa. You got it. It's 68. It's this guy. Who's that? Do people know? There, oh, oh, it's the famous hair. Jagger, that's right, Justin. Yarmer Jagger on the Pittsburgh Penguins. You can't quite see the 68, but you can look it up. I decided to go with an image that focused on the hair, rather, his famous hockey hair, um, rather than um, rather than the number. But you can look it up. It's it, The number is uh, 68. And you know what? Why I chose that? I mean, first of all, you know, he was drafted in 1990. So, like, my teen years, he was... Uh, you know, the best player in the league and, you know, second all time um, in points to Wayne Gretzky. Um, but, but one of the things was this was the first time that I learned history through hockey. Um, so I remember hearing one, one of the things that's interesting about Yager is just because of the timing, you know, the opening of the Soviet Union, the post communist um, uh, world, um, Yager was able to come and play just, you know, he, he was, born at the right time and was able to come and play um, uh, in North America. Um, but I remember as, you know, as a kid in the 90s, I don't remember, at, at, or a teenager in the 90s, actually, I don't remember at what point um, uh, hearing this, but that he chose his number 68. He wore number 68. Does anybody know why for bonus? I don't have another mug to give away, but for bonus points, anybody know why he wore number 68? Professor Carroll knows. The, the Czech Rebellion. That's right. It was so. It was the year of. It was the year of the what was known as the Prague Spring, the the, the socialist revolt against. It was a a moderate socialist revolt for an attempt for a, um, uh, essentially to break away from the Moscow directed Communist Party in 1968, and the Soviet Union invaded the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, I should say, at the time, uh, in 1968, and his his his. I want to. Say, I don't remember if it was his father or grandfather. It must be his grandfather died in prison in that year. Um, so he wore this. Wore this. Um, uh, you know, as in, you know, acknowledgement. And he was like, "I'm not anti-Russian. I'm not anti-Russian." In fact, he played in Russia and I think owned part of a team in Russia for years after his retirement. He's like, "I'm not anti-Russian, but I'm just commemorating." He's anti-communist. He's comm commemorating the um, uh, the invasion of Czechoslovakia. So that was the first time I. I I learned some European history through uh, through hockey. So, Anna, congratulations. Where are you, Anna? I'm here. Thank you. Congratulations. You get this really nice two-tone right here. Um, and, um, and Millie, wherever you are, you have a Prague mug right now, Mikhail. Very nice. Is it one of the one of the flags on your wall? It's, it's competing with space with Estonia. I love the Estonian flag. Um, Millie. Millie McChaney, you have not come for your bug yet. You got to come by Renaissance Park at some point too. Um, okay, so today's commemorative mug. Mm. I got to move my head out of the way. Okay, so I'll start with the back. In the back, uh, I'm having focusing trouble. So the back is the interior of um, the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, which is the seat of the Boston Archdiocese. Um, oh no, you've forgotten you're back home now. Oh no. Uh, where's home, Millie? Uh, Seattle, Washington. Mm. Uh, you're coming back next semester? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Unlike Michaela abandoning, abandoning us to the FSB. Uh, can I cover my face? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I can. Um, so, uh, Millie, you'll get it. You'll get it done. Um, that's very thoughtful. Jack is concerned about my neck, which I have had a pinched nerve in, by the way. Um, so you'll get it next semester. So on the back, we have uh, the Cathedral of the Archdiocese um, 
in Boston, which is not far from from Northeastern, by the way. It's walking distance from Northeastern. Now, on the front, this was the point of controversy. I mentioned this, right? So I was busted by Zazzle, right? So like three days, I put a I put the movie poster to spotlight on it. Like three days later, they canceled it for copyright infringement. I found a still from the film. I replaced that instead. The next day, they canceled it for copyright infringement. But they let me get away with this. And I didn't take this photo either, but I guess they don't know that. So on the front, <laughs> on the front, we have a nice... Um, a nice picture of the exterior of the Boston Globe. And Professor uh, Carroll has his own because he lives like two blocks from my house in West Roxbury. Uh, so I was able to, we were about to able to meet up for coffee and I could hand deliver, deliver it uh, to him. Um, so it has the, the exterior of the old Boston Globe building um, in Dorchester. You'll be running past my house soon after this class. Very nice. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the thumbs up. Do you want me to give you a refresher of water? You can drink the water. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, the students know the students know that Tuesday is is um, garbage and recycling day in West Roxbury because the, the trucks <laughs> roll fast and I had to mute it. Um, so yeah, so it's the exterior of the old um, old Boston Globe building on Morrissey Avenue, um, which is which is pretty nice. And I and I used the font that was trying to get the Boston the closest I could get to the, the Boston Globe-ish uh, font. Um, so it's it's a really it's a really nice one, and you're gonna like the the trivia question I have for you. Mm, and coffee out of a commemorative mug is always more delicious than other kinds of coffee. Um, so I am going to uh, I'm going to introduce um, uh, I'm going to introduce but Jack just said I'm going to crash Professor Carroll's presentation by going over to his house. That would be pretty funny if I just walked in the door. <laughs> Actually, my my last my last um, my last divergence or tangent will be about the um, the um, uh, um, the the in the movie the house that is supposed to be professor carroll's house right it's immediately next to um uh one of my closest friends where my one of my closest friends lives um where it's shot not where he actually lives although it's only like a block away um and you know so his claim to flame is that they put a porta potty on his front lawn for three days <laughs> they asked him to put a we put a porta potty here while we shoot next door and he's like okay fine and they put a porta potty on his front lawn for a few days so that that he feels that he contributed to the movie and in, in some small way he helped out um okay so uh matt carroll is a journalism professor of the practice at northeastern um you know, I think that there are some future journalism uh, students uh, among you, and so I really recommend um, you taking a class with him any chance that you get. Um, he was a reporter for the Boston Globe for 26 years, uh, where he specialized in using data for story storytelling, um, which is a lot of what he teaches at Northeastern. Uh, he won a Pulitzer Prize, uh, as you probably all know, um, in 2003 for public service um, for his work on, uh, on the Spotlight um, team reporting on uh, the Catholic Church uh, sexual abuse scandal. Um, and before coming to Northeastern, he ran the Future of News initiative um, at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and we're going to do the, the sort of conversation I'm going to have with Professor Carroll. I'm going to ask him to set things up a bit. But I know this is really a topic of a lot of interest to students. So, you know, ask questions in the chat and I'll moderate or I can leave them uh, to the end. Um, but, you know, to start off, Professor Carroll, um, the scandal was a very big deal, uh, to put it mildly. Um, you know, at, at, it, it, there's the, there's the garbage trucks. It actually, um, you know, it resulted in uh, the resignation of Cardinal Law. I mean, it re resulted in the resignation of um, the Cardinal of the Archdiocese of Boston, among um, many other uh, many other casualties, uh, of course, um, and uh, and financial um, a financial a significant financial impact uh, as well. But it 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 really um, shook Boston, and it shook uh, it shook the city's confidence in the church, which was uh, a really influential. 
um, institution or, or perhaps still is. So I, I thought you maybe you could walk us through how um, how the spotlight team decided to take up this investigation, decided um, uh, to tackle this subject, um, and, and what you saw as the questions um, that were at the center of the investigation um, as you started it up. Sure. So the can everyone hear me? Can you hear me okay? Okay, so um, the way the, the whole investigation started is a bit of global legend at this point. Marty Barron was the new editor. He'd been hired from the Miami Herald, and his, he had read um, a column by a columnist named Eileen McNamara about this priest, Father John Gagan, who had been charged with assaulting boys in a number of different parishes, uh, but the, all the evidence was sealed by the court. And Marty was coming from Florida, where the courts are very much wide open. It's a really good, it's a real good sun, sunshine state, literally and figuratively, in the sense that it's really difficult to seal evidence inside a court. So almost all evidence is always available to the public. So Marty, on his first day at the Globe, was wondering, why is this case sealed up? This sounds like it might be a very interesting case. And he talked it over with his other editors, and he said, let's give it the spotlight. And so that was his basically one of his first things he did on his first day on the job, which is pretty remarkable. And uh, the story just kind of took off from there. It was, uh, I mean, I think it, it helped a little bit that, that Marty was an outsider. He was coming obviously from a different place. He had never lived in Boston before. He was also Jewish in a very Catholic community. Boston is the, has more Catholics than any other large city in the country. And um, I think, most people knew that there were issues with priests. I certainly did. I grew up a very, in a very Catholic household and I went to Catholic schools through high school. And there were always sort of a priest or brothers who we were told, you know, just stay away from this guy, it's kind of weird. But I don't think anyone had any clue as to how, or I, I shouldn't say that. A, a small handful of people knew the breadth of the problem, but the average person, the average Catholic just knew that there was a couple of weirdo priests out there and just to kind of stay away from them. Um, but the breadth of the problem very quickly just stunned us all at how many priests there were and, and how the church was covering it all up. And the central question became the cover-up. And, uh, you know, was the church covering up a major issue? And that really became, it really was a cover-up story. So that was what, um, that's really what we, we dove into. I just muted you instead of instead of unmuting myself there. <laughs> Sorry, I'll. Uh, okay, there we go. I'm unmuted. Yeah. So one of the questions, one of the things that that sort of amazed me um, in terms of the story of of how um, uh, how the the priests were protected uh, by the uh, the archdiocese and were and were moved around um, and, and really given a level of consideration that the victims didn't have, right, um, is, and it talked about the cover-up, is why why the church is so reluctant to have secular authorities um, punish or prosecute um, uh, priests who were clearly breaking the law, right? And now they've, they've instituted their own, um, I think, internationally policies about co cooperating with police officers, but that really came out of this scandal, right? Why were they so reluctant to have um, to have sec secular authorities actually punish lawbreakers? Yeah, I actually, I gotta turn off my heater here. Uh, so the, <laughs> um, I mean, I, the church is a two thousand year old institution, and like many institutions, it seeks to protect its own. Um, and I don't think that the Catholic Church is any different than a lot of institutions. Actually, I mean, it's you know, at, at two thousand years old, it's bigger. It has way more traditions. It has a lot to protect. Um, it has a lot to lose, and so they're very, very protective of their, their sort of their elite, the priests. Um, there was a story actually in the Globe this past week about police officers not getting charged by their own, and I think that's just another example. Institutions protect their own, and we have this institution which is very old, um, very valued in a lot of communities, and a lot of people were willing to defend the church, including a lot of people in law in previous decades, including people in law enforcement, in newspapers, uh, and a lot of other places to uh, to protect the that elite, those 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 priests. 
It, it's so funny because you bring that up, but that because when I read that, um, uh, you know, that big spread, that story in the Globe this weekend, um, that's exactly what I thought since I had been you know, preparing for this class. I, 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 I said, you know, the, the the similarities here are are really incredible. How, um, you know, how. The this so for those who didn't read it, the the article really is about how when police officers break the law in Boston, um, well they're not treated like everybody else. Um, often they're not charged for 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 um, charged for for crimes like drinking and driving that others would be charged for, and um, sometimes um, they're uh, in, instead of essentially being charged, they're or, or they're, they resign and and um, they're sort of shown the door, um, which of course other people don't have the have the option uh, to do. I think the article said something like, uh, you know, uh, if you're if you get charged with something, you don't have the and you work for Home Depot, you don't have the option to resign from Home Depot to avoid a uh, um, to avoid you know a trial. Um, but yeah, I, 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 and what the other thing that it made me think of was that how this, how this sort of, um, uh, when, when people avoid uh, any sort of punishment, right, when they are not um, uh, subject to the same laws of others, uh, a culture of impunity forms, right? Um, and that seems to be, you know, what happened in the church as well, because the, the priests knew that essentially there weren't real consequences. Um, except for being moved to another parish, a culture of impunity formed, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that was, it, it, it's so difficult to comprehend now. And I, and I think a lot of it was that, frankly, priests are not married. And so they just had very little, they have very little understanding of what it's like to be in a married relationship, to have children. Uh, and so they just had no concept of the, hurt they were doing to families to kids um you know it, it's just it's incomprehensible now that they would not that when they would find out that a priest had been abusing kids they weren't you know getting families into counseling and everything else and uh it's just totally shocking and the fact that they moved them around and let them abuse more kids it's just totally mind-boggling now i mean people, that's and that's really what drove the whole story when that first story ran it was like a bomb went off and um i always they used to use the phrase soccer moms and um i always felt that the story was driven by soccer moms who just were furious that the church they loved was putting their children in harm's way by moving these guys around from parish to parish and just letting them do really bad bad stuff to their kids and uh it it just infuriated mothers especially and dads too but it was the story seemed to me to be the anger seemed to me to be driven by the mothers you know, it's funny because there was a, there was a, you know, you mentioned uh, growing up and, and um, sort of being aware of problematic priests um, to, to stay away from. And there's actually a scene in, in the film version, you know, I don't know to which, to what extent this actually took place, but, you know, in the, um, the, the principal or head of school's office at BC High with Robbie, the editor, um, who who says like yeah we knew there was a priest on this list who who we knew and we knew he was sort of weird and you know but I ran track and you played something else uh, ha, ha, the the he was a hockey coach right so yeah. but the person the alum he was like you played football or something like okay. that but you know the kid kid who got abused he played hockey right and he was the hockey coach so it was just a matter of luck basically with the sport that we played. But he made an acknowledgement that that they sort of knew that this guy was there was something off about this guy, and there's an earlier scene in the film too where they're at the Catholic Charities Gala, right? And Robbie is st talking to the bar to, at the bar to some uh, uh, senior person with connections to the archdiocese. I, mean, I asked you about who this was supposed to be. You said it's sort of um, a hybrid character of 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 uh, a number of different people who are, I suppose, like well-connected, better-off people within the community connected to the archdiocese. And he says, you know, I, I want, you know, did it take a, it took a village to protect these people. When we, when we are covering now the amount, um, uh, the amount of evidence that there is, you know, he's really, he asks, are we complicit? Did we not, you know, a lot of people had to not act out and a lot of people had to not talk 
hundreds of people um, had to say nothing when they knew. Um, aren't we complicit? Um, and you know, so this is one of the things I'm I, I'm wondering about. You know, and not to to ask you, but uh, a personal question. But you know, you went to Catholic school growing up, and um, and everybody on the Spotlight team, right, uh, grew up Catholic. Um, was this was this personal for people? Um, and and did they think that maybe? Um, at least, you know, the way it's portrayed in the film, uh, it's certainly, at least for the character who plays Robbie, this is this is sort of a personal amends making of sorts, right? Yeah, um, no, I mean, you know, it, there is totally a personal element. And actually, uh, I, I went to Zaverian Brothers in Westwood, and which was, uh, and one, and I mentioned, you know, there were brothers you were told to stay away from. And one of those brothers, his name popped on one, popped up in one of the lists. I don't think he was ever prosecuted or anything. And I, don't, I have no idea what happened to him, to be honest. But, uh, you know, you, it, those are the kind of moments where you sort of break into a little bit of a cold sweat because you realize, like, Robbie's conversation with that guy. You could have been one of those kids. You just, you know, these naive 14, 16-year-old boys. And, uh, you know, they are like mini gods, basically, brothers and priests. And so you do with it what they're told. So, um, yeah, it's it's... It, it, it really strikes home. It just totally strikes home. And I, you know, I, I have come from a, my aunt was a nun. My father was in the parish council. So we had a priest in our house all the time and nothing ever happened. But uh, you do realize uh, how, how easily it could have happened. And did you feel, did you feel, um, did you feel pressure not to report the case? I mean, did you feel either social or, um, or emotional or, or actual pressure due to the influence of the church? Did you feel pre pressure not to report on it? There wasn't pressure not to report on it, but there was definitely concern to get it right. Uh, a decade earlier, there'd been another priest named Father Porter. And um, this was down at Fall River, which is just south of Boston. And a decade earlier, more, more than that, he had abused a lot of kids when, when uh, and as they got older, they started accusing him. And uh, but basically it became a he said, she said. So basically you have like a hundred males and females saying this guy abused me. And he's saying, I didn't do it. And there was no paper to show that the church knew about anything. Um, and the story just kind of got stuck there and hung up on the he said, she said part. And the Globe wrote a lot of stories about it. It really angered the community after a while, which very much split into people who believed that the kids uh, now adults and those who believe the priest and people started saying, oh, you're Catholic bashing. And um, uh, so people canceled subscriptions, they canceled advertising. So it was, you know, we pick it out front the whole bit. So there was a concern that it not turn into another father porter type situation. We had to have the goods, which we did get. And and what was the reaction? I mean, how how did, um, how did, maybe you could, uh, you know, walk the students through a bit, uh, how, um, how the public reacted and how the church reacted. What some I, I mentioned the ramifications just really briefly, but maybe um, you could expand a little for them on 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 excuse me how things unfolded. Yeah. So so the difference between that case and actually uh, a lot of other cases around the country in Minnesota, Louisiana, was that we had church documents which showed that the church knew all about it. It was actively covering up these cases, and they were in fact moving priests, once they were accused, they were moving them from one parish to another where they could abuse more children. And these documents were really simple. And they would say something like, Father Gagan abused another boy, move him to this parish, don't tell the Monsignor there what he did. So even the Monsignors at these places didn't know um, about, the, didn't know the backgrounds of, of, of some of these priests. And um, so we, this is early days of the internet. So we were posting PDFs online and we're also just running page after page of these documents in the paper, just take pictures of them and running the, the whole documents. So people could read the documents for themselves. So it was a very, very different reaction from the Father Porter case where it was people angry at the Globe. Now the Globe was kind of just a messenger and people were really angry at the church. And people understood what we were doing um, and it really wasn't us against the church. We were just reporting what the church had done. And so people just got so, so angry at the church. How and did the it, church- it exploded. The, uh, and the, the, react there's the last scene in the movie shows the phone just ringing off the hook in the spotlight office, and that is exactly what happened. We had to bring down co-ops and interns just to answer the phones for days on end. Otherwise, we just couldn't have got um, any work done. It started off Boston, and then within a couple of days, it was national. And then when, you know, within a few weeks, it was international. We were getting calls from all over the world. And, but there were still some people who felt that... Um 
you know, your whole effort to expose this was anti-Catholic, right? I mean, yeah, there were, but it was a tiny, tiny minority. And I think even they felt kind of overwhelmed by the whole situation. Whereas before it was, you know, I, I, this, it's really hard to quantify how, what people thought, but it was a su substantial group of people before who were angry at the globe. Now, you know, it must've been like 99% plus were angry at the, at the church rather than at us. Uh, there was still one or two people who went out there and picketed, I think, and, you know, definitely wrote angry emails or letters, but there was, there was just so few of them. And what was the church's response? Um, within a couple of days, Cardinal Law held a press conference apologizing for it, but people were so angry. It was just like this unbelievable reaction and donations in the church just fell off a cliff very, very quickly. And, um, Cardinal Law has a, you know, I, I forget what it's called. It's not really a board of directors, but that's what it amounts to. And even they, they were totally taken aback. They had no idea of what was going on. And so they were angry with him. And at one point he was talking about putting aside money to pay claims. And they're like, wait a second, we have no idea how, how many people there are, how long this is going to take. We, we can't even stop talking about this. We just have to start doing uh, some damage control. And they were really, really angry at him too. So, um, the backlash was just huge and immediate. And people were people weren't people picketing his masses too. At, people were picketing uh, his masses, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, law must go. They were holding signs and putting up signs in front of uh, the the the, uh, the cathedral in um, in the South End, and uh, uh, it was intense. And the, there was this little group um, of people who, uh, who were who had been abused and called SNAP, and it had been this little tiny group of 10 or 15 people. And within a few weeks, it was like a thousand plus. Um, it just, the group just exploded. And I mean, what, what did it do to the influence of the church? Uh, and um, I mean, you the students had to read uh, one of the articles um, about, um, uh, about how much this shook people's confidence um, uh, in, in the, you know, I guess the moral righteousness of the church, and and uh, and asking you know, to what extent it would, um, uh, it it would affect the influence um, of the church. But that article was written only, I think, two months after the whole thing broke, right? Yeah. Um, and there's a much much longer unraveling uh, of um, of events, you know, leading to obviously uh, Law's resignation. So, I mean, how do you perceive, you know, as somebody who was involved in the story, also somebody who um, grew up, you know, involved in the church, um, and then, you know, after raised raised children, right, uh, in 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 this neighborhood where people still go, you you will attest that uh, people still go to church. I always laugh because, you know, there's um, we, we are right on the border of two parishes, uh, Holy Name Parish and Saint Teresa's Parish, which each have their own school and rectory and everything. But Holy Name is a huge church right on the Rotary, and you know, on Sundays it's still uh, all you know, all blocked with, well, not these days, but uh, pre-COVID, right? People are like quadruple parked um, yeah. to go to church. And I always joke, I thought church attendance is down, you know, uh, causing traffic in the rotary on Sundays. You know, pe people still go to church um, in this uh, in this neighborhood. But um, anyway, the, the question is, you know, you grew up Catholic, you re raised your kids in a Catholic neighborhood. Uh, and this happened, um, you know, really, I guess, you know, not to get personal in terms of your kids, but your kids were young, right? Yep. And so this happened like right at that sort of fulcrum moment. You know, how do you feel that that the influence of the church changed or if it did at all? Um, no, it totally did. I mean, it, part, part of it was um, a long-term process where frankly, a lot of institutions, are, uh, their influence has been eroding, whether it's government, church, uh, media. Um, and this just sort of really accelerated that and you know I just know so many people who came to me afterwards and said I just stopped going to church afterwards um it really shook people's faith in 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 the church and um the, the long-term implications are, have just been huge I mean I don't know what the church collects in money now and I'm sure it, it recovered somewhat but I I know they took a massive hit that lasted a long time as far as donations and it wasn't just Boston I mean it just it spread across the country um so it was uh the, the long-term implications were huge and, and yep. one of the things that, that um really just 
I continue to marvel at is that there continue to be stories about this across the country. And, you know, two or three years ago, it was Pennsylvania, and they just released this huge report on the number of, of priests who've been abusing kids. And it's, and that, uh, you know, and it, uh, it, it just, it's, a, it's amazing that it's still going on. It really is. I mean, it's a story that broke in, in 2002. And, you know, 18, 19 years later, it's still going on. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. Yeah, no, it really is. And within within Boston, I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, I when we had coffee, I was mentioning to you is that to a certain extent, the the continued financial problems sort of exacerbate the inequality um, within the city in the sense that, I mean, now uh, the, the archdiocese is uh, is centrally run, of course, and has some ability to uh, to distribute resources, right? Um, but you know, in the current pandemic, our Catholic schools here in our neighborhood are are overflowing with students who are switching. Um, people are switching from BPS um, Boston Public Schools into um, the Catholic schools. Those who weren't already in Catholic schools, right? Whereas um, in other parishes. When people have lost their jobs, they can't afford to to send their kids um, to the the six thousand dollars or whatever the tuition is, which is you know fairly low for private school tuition, but high for for somebody's income. And so the parish is actually um, sorry, the archdiocese is actually closing schools in some parishes. Um, and you know, presumably, that's a reflection of the overall financial health of of the institution. So you know, the, the financial reverberations really do continue, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, and, I, you know, I, again, what what, ha what we did, it basically accelerated sort of a long-term decline in the church. And uh, there was, you know, the number of people going into the priesthood before that had been shrinking pretty steadily through the years. And, and matter of fact, that, that played a role in why a lot of these people weren't what, these guys weren't just bounced out of the church was because they were desperate for priests. Or they didn't have enough. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have enough. So they kept yeah. some people, They and they admitted people that they knew were just not really good material. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, you see that very clearly. Uh, we, we had the uh, the notes of Gagan, who was the guy who lived around the corner from me. And uh, he became sort of the, um, the focal point of a, of a lot of this. And he, uh, there were all sorts of memos written about him when he was entering the seminary that was like, this guy has all sorts of issues. We really don't want him in here. But he, uh, his father was a very prominent Monsignor and was able to push to keep him in. Uh, so, yeah, they kept a lot of bad people. His father was a Monsignor? Mon no, his, I'm sorry, his uncle. Did I say okay. <laughs> Retired <laughs> Monsignor? Scandal. Another scandal. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, but what about, I'm curious about what about the, the so there's there's the, the moral influence and, um, and, um, and people, uh, you know, not attending church, let's say in the same, uh, the same numbers. But, you know, the Catholic Church in Boston had, had actual political influence too, right? actual influence right and this is one of the key i don't know how accurate you would think that the um that the movie is in this but this is one of the key themes of in the movie is 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 the political influence that the church had you know in da's um in judges um in the you know cardinal law meets with i, I assume this happened maybe you could maybe it didn't but cardinal law meets with marty baron the editor when he gets his job the expectation is that the editor of of the globe has a sit down with the, with the cardinal, right? And the institutions that are um, rearing the political leadership of the city itself, right? You, you again, everything goes back to Wash Roxbury, but we both know from Little League, from hockey, um, right? Uh, and Daniel, I see, we, I know we have, uh, we have one, one student from, from the neighborhood who, um, who then uh, went on to Boston Latin. Um, so we can probably attest to this, um, you know, the, the, these institutions, uh, Catholic Memorial, BC High, um, you know, Boston College and Boston College Law School, they're really, um, I don't know what pipelines, I don't know what the best metaphor is, but, but they're really the way into, you know, oh, you went to Holy Name. Okay, so Daniel went to Holy Name um, and then Boston Latin, right? These are... Um, uh, so you know what I'm talking about, about the traffic and the rotary. <laughs> um, That's right. 
<laughs> so these are these are these are really pipelines into city government, right? And I'm always amazed, you know, at because <laughs> you know at every every local event, right? Um, Marty Walsh um, and or Charlie Baker show up and just these like neighborhood things. Um, and I, I actually at one point, so we have, um, uh, you know, about the Shamrock shootout, Matt? No. You don't know about that? Daniel, you must know about that, right? So so on, on Temple Street every May, the, the families on Temple Street order, um, organize a, um, a street hockey tournament. Oh, cool. um, except for last year, they've been doing this for maybe it was after after your kids were a little older. They've probably been doing this for from what I hear, like 10, 15 years or something like that. Um, but I guess it wasn't last year. It was the year before, you know, uh, Charlie Baker, um, the police commissioner, you know, I mean, just absolutely. I'm, I don't think I saw Mayor Walsh, but like absolutely everybody shows up for the street hockey tournament, you know, yeah. and Charlie, and the funniest thing is how it's not even a big deal, right? Like, like Charlie Baker is wandering around clearly like expecting people are going to come up to him. I had to tell my daughter and some of her friends, go take a picture with the governor to, to make him feel better you know, <laughs> because he's just standing there alone. Um, but the point is that, um, you know, that, that people have access to power uh, in this neighborhood in part through the church. Right. Yeah. And there's an actual political influence um, of the church. Um, and so that's all my long prelude to saying, did, did this change any of that? You know, yeah, I mean, that had been, that had, I mean, the, the opening scene in the movie shows, you know, it was sort of a generic, um, there was no real names attached to it. But basically, it just, we're, we're, you know, somewhere in the past 30 years, maybe the 70s or 60s or something, there was a police station, and the uh, priest had been accused of molesting a kid, and they, the church basically gets him out without any charges being filed and hushes it up with the connivance of the police. Um, and that stuff had happened in the past. Um, when you're saying exact, what you're saying is exactly right. There was this really strong tradition of Catholics being in power, in politics, in police, in the newspapers. And, you know, Marty was the first non, um, I don't know, it might have been a Protestant editor before, but basically he was definitely the first Jewish editor of the paper. And so that made a big difference. And uh, so the paper had changed. Now it was owned by the New York Times. It wasn't owned by a, a bedrock Protestant, a Protestant family. Um, now it was owned by, a, by the New York Times, and they did not really care about who you were. They just wanted the best news done. And um, Marty was invited to meet with Cardinal Law, and the, uh, um, Marty was given a catechism by Cardinal Law, which is actually the one that the actor playing him, Liev Schreiber, is, is holding in the, in the car. Really? Yeah. So funny. So, yeah, it was funny. And, you know, I think Cardinal Law was just sort of sniffing around a little bit, trying to find out what kind of influence he would have with Marty, which was zero. Um, but yeah, so there was things had changed pretty dramatically over the past, you know, things had just kind of eroded over the last 30 or 40 years. What about in the city, though, just as I mean, not relating to, um, you know, specifically to your experience at Spotlight, but but just your your own professional assessment, you know. What about what about in the city? I mean, do you think think it's changing at all? I mean, I, you look at let's say um, the city councilors who are now going to challenge Marty Walsh uh, um, for the mayorship. Um, do you think the influence of uh, the political influence of the church's institutions uh, is just as strong in the city, or or um, in a much lower key way? I mean, because Marty is Catholic, I'm sure he shows up at people's baptisms and funerals, and like you're saying, he shows up at the hockey tournaments. Um, but it's their influence has really been compromised. I mean, the people I think still look at Marty and say, "Oh, he's a Catholic like me." So yeah, so there is some of that residual stuff there, but not nearly as much as they used to be. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, no, I, I I wonder, you know, I wonder about, um, uh, yeah, I wonder about about the the future uh, in terms of the both the cultural and political role um, of uh, in the city, um, how it's gonna how it's gonna develop. Um, uh, over time, it's a really interesting question because the city, of course, as it's become more diverse, has not become less Catholic, right? Um, if you look at at 
how, uh, let's say, East Boston has developed, right? So it was, you know, Irish and then Jews and Italians moved in and Jews, Jews were there uh, only really briefly for like 20 years and became a predominantly uh, Italian neighborhood. But as Italians moved out, you know, it's, now it's majority Latin American, right? Um, so also a Catholic community. Um, uh, yeah. You look at Dor how Dorchester has diversified, you know, Latin American, um, Haitians, both Protestants and Catholics. Um, but the city has become more diverse, but uh, but not actually less Catholic. I don't know the exact numbers. So um, I wonder, the, you know, how these things are going to sort of unroll, unfold in, in the future. Yeah, I don't know either. And I mean, I think there was culturally, it was a lot more cohesive group. I mean, there were just so many Irish and they were all Catholic. Uh, it was such a dominant block for such a long, long time. Now it's, you know, the Catholic block, if you want to think of it that way, has been broken up. Now it's, you know, there's Irish, there's, um, uh, you know, different different Hispanic groups uh, who have their own agendas and, you know, are also split into smaller groups. So it's it's a very different kind of dynamic now. Yeah. And and it's really funny. I think in the, I think in the, in, I don't remember if it's in the first article about Gagan or the second article about Gagan, um, but you, you mention um the the influence of Catholic um, judges and Catholic it, it was in one of those articles one of the, yeah. the Gagan ones yeah I think it was the second one yeah yeah uh, about about how it been been hard to get prosecutions because the the la the sort of deference of the Catholic judges themselves you know yeah and that's um, that's something that changed As a matter of fact uh, one of the, the the weird coincidences here was that um, when, so my, I had a son who went to Roxbury Latin, which is, as you know, is right around, literally down the end of the street from you, but it's a, only a half mile from me. And uh, so, I, you know, my son was going there, so I'd go to his soccer games and stuff. And there was this judge there, not, very nice woman, and we'd just hear his son was playing soccer too. So we'd just sort of see each other at soccer games and chat. And then all of a sudden, I just didn't see her anymore, or I'd see her, but she just would not talk to me. <laughs> and uh, then I realized what had happened was that, the first story had come out, Gagan was being charged, and she was the judge that was going to sentence Gagan or was going to hear his case. And she wanted nothing more to do with me. She read that story. and She was like, oh, my God. Later, she told me, as soon as I read that story, I said, I can't, I can't talk to Matt anymore at all. So she just stayed away from me. Um, but, yeah. Uh, That's really it. fascinating because, um, in the end, Gagan was – charged for a relatively minor offense and slapped the maximum penalty right yeah so the influence had clearly it actually had had an effect in the oh, sentencing yeah. oh yeah yeah i mean right? yeah i she, she had read the stories i mean yeah. I, I never asked specific her specifically that but to me the implication was pretty clear she'd read the stories knew he was a bad guy and just whacked him really hard and then, yeah. he, got murdered, then he got murdered in prison uh, that's right a, yeah a yeah yeah, for for yeah, so for students who don't know, I mean, Gagan went to prison. The the in the um, uh, in the readings, those first two readings, which focus on on Gagan, um, but he had wait, oh, he was in prison at that point, or he no, was not. No, he, no, he was, was not. not. So he went to he was being charged, um, but the, the it was it was for molest like it was a, a molestation charge, but. For like grabbing, uh, you know, grabbing a child's uh, buttocks in a public pool, um, and now don't get me wrong, this is this is terrible, um, but it, it is clear that he had engaged in, I mean, r really, uh, you know, sex acts with children, um, and you know, and and uh, really, even even I would say not uh, uh, even more horrendous things. Um, you know, which he hadn't been charged with in the past, but in the end, he was given this ten-year sentence um, for for the molestation. So clearly, they were attempting to um, I don't know if right past wrongs is the right answer, but but to 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 not let him off the hook. Um, and yes, he was he was killed in in prison. I also looked up. I was curious um, uh, about um, the Patrick McSorley. Um, who was uh, this kid from this family in Hyde Park um, who uh, had been abused by Gagan, him and all of his brothers. They were living in public housing in Hyde Park and Gagan sort of c 
comes into the rescue to help out this um, this mother, um, you know, clearly uh, pre- uh, what's the word pre- praying, uh, yeah. not predating, praying uh, on the on the children, um, and you know had just a left a horrible horrible um, impact on on um, on these kids. And Patrick McSorley is one of the one of this lawyer, um, Mitch Garbedian's clients, and he meets with uh, Michael uh, Resendez um, from from the Globe, and he agrees to give his name, and that's that's in the he g- gave his name in the um, in the article when you read the article, um, and I, you know I was curious when I was reading it what sort of what became of him and I Googled him and he committed suicide. Yeah, it was very um, unfortunate. Very nice guy. He, or he, or drug overdose, I think. I don't know if it was a suicide. Drug yeah, overdose, it pretty, yeah. It seemed like it was a suicide anyway. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it was just really sad. He was a young guy and yeah, I know. It was just very, very sad. He was at all the press conferences. He was very supportive of Mitch. He just came across as this really sweet young guy and uh, I don't know what demons were in his head, uh, you know, yeah, so but he did kill himself, yeah. Deeply troubled. Um, so I was wondering what you think, you know, so this became a um, an international scandal, obviously. Um, it had, had major reverberations um, uh, around the world. And I think, you know, when we were talking about it, um, you know, you made a great point, which was that um, uh, that uh, it it prevented uh, the church in different locations from saying, you know, just a couple of bad apples, right? This is an isolated thing. This is a couple of bad apples, and and it really exposed the systemic nature of this problem and the systemic nature um, of the cover up. Um, so you know, I was wondering if if there was anything specifically about Boston um, that was was different, or that it was just it was the same thing happening everywhere, or that there was something specific about the sort of Boston um, experience. I mean, as far as the Catholic Church goes, no, it was the same everywhere. I mean, the, the difference, frankly, was that we had a we have a good newsroom here that was willing to spend a lot of money to dig into this, Marty. Baron later said that he put the costs of, you know, between an original group of four reporters that expanded to 10, working on it for basically a year at the, just the personnel cost alone at roughly a million dollars. I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, but as far as the church itself, same thing everywhere. And, you know, we, we were getting, we very quickly began getting calls from reporters around the country sort of looking for how we had done it. And it it was pretty simple. You just start digging into the court records and look for priest names and then just start, you know, peeling it back. And by that point, um, because there had been so much publicity about the Boston case, many, many more people were willing to come forward. And I'm sure we're just reaching out to their local newsrooms anyways. And this, it, it just exploded across so many different places so fast. At so the end of the you... movie, they were on those black cards, just listing scandals and, you know, across the country and then yeah. internationally. And there's, it, you know, I've seen the movie like 10 or 11 times now in uh, with different groups, and there's always dead silence when those cards stop popping up. You could just look at the names. Um, it's really powerful. Yeah, no, I, I remember the funny thing is, I remember growing up, you know, in Canada that there was a major scandal in the Catholic Church's running abuse uh, in running the reservation schools um, yeah. for Native uh, people, especially um, in the West. Um, but I think you're right that it, it was it was possible for this to be a scandal that was like that was there, right? You know, okay, this was this was a problem in these remote schools that had no supervision from, and, you know, and, and they could do whatever they want, um, rather than than it being exposed as um, uh, as a systemic um, uh, problem. Um, so what what part of the of your reporting of all of this? So you ran hundreds of of um, uh, of articles. About six hundred uh, the first year, yeah. Six hundred the first year. This is a, this is the importance of local news, right? I mean, this is yeah. this really highlights um, the ability for local newspapers um, to do uh, to do what they need to do. Um, and, and it's funny because you know I this is a different story, but you know. As I get older, um, 
uh, I enjoy the Boston Globe more. You know, when I moved, when I moved to um, uh, to Boston, um, uh, and I first started getting to the Boston Globe, I will I will admit that I switched uh, at a certain point to the New York Times because it was reporting on. I'm not trying to be insulting. This is going to end oh, well. I, I, I read it, the Times. I love the Times. Yeah. You know, for 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 a young person doing a PhD in history and you know coming from Canada, it was. I wasn't that interested in Boston's local issues right i was yeah. interested in more international things you know now nah, but you know I, I at some point i i you know whenever we moved away we moved back at some point i got the boston globe again and now i love the boston globe and i read it first specifically because it's local right because i right. live yeah, here absolutely. you know my 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 um you know my i have my kids here i i know many of the people who they're reporting on you know the institutions i mean the, you know they're reporting on northeastern they're reporting on um, on the schools and all of these issues that that affect my life. Um, now it's the exact opposite. Those the Boston Globe has has the issues I need to know about, right? Um, so this is you know again a, a really um, about the importance of uh, local news and local reporting. But so of those six hundred articles in that first year, um, wh what made what was the biggest uh, what had the biggest blowback? What was you know there were different different themes, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, you'd have to point to those first two articles because they really got the ball rolling, especially the first article. Um, and that just kind of just ignited the whole thing. And that just sort of set the tone and the tenor for the rest of the year. And um, we did, I and mean, we kept doing different stories about different priests, about um, different situations, different schools. Um, but we really, those first ones were the big ones and it, you know, it, it's just hard to get sort of to put them in perspective. They were by far the most impactful by far. See, that's so funny because when, when I read them to me, I, I mean, those first two, two, um, I guess maybe, maybe it's my cynicism of almost expecting a, a cover up, but you know, those two articles, they focused on the cover up, but they also focused on one particular, um, uh, bad priest, right? Yeah. Whereas the article that 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 lists the you know the the hundreds you know the 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 what is it seventy six that there was that there were seventy six settlements or um, uh, yeah there've been like seventy six settlements yeah you know, seventy six settlements I mean that to me was was the um, the really uh, the really astonishing um, uh, um, the one that really blew my mind I okay think. so yeah. actually. I'll tell you why, why that happened. And you're, you're exactly right. In a perfect world, we should have run that story first, sort of set the scope, sort of the framework for like, this is a massive scandal going on. But what was happening was Gagan was going to, the, our story ran on a Sunday. Gagan was going to trial on Wednesday, I think, or Tuesday. So we had to, the, the, our feeling was we need to get his story out first because we had sort of a news hook, which was his trial coming up. So we wanted to get that one done first. So that was kind of why we did Gagan first. But you're right, you're absolutely right. Normally you said, you know, you, you sort of do the story that, that sort of frames the entire situation, how many people involved, it's a big scandal, all that kind of stuff. So in a perfect world, we would have done the second story first, but because of circumstances, we ran the Gagan story first. Were people surprised by the number of people involved or? Oh, um... yeah, people were shocked. I mean, it was just, it was stunning. Um, you know, now with the, you know, and I think, you know, part of that cynicism you mentioned, I think that was because we did those stories 18 years ago and people were like, oh yeah, okay. And it, and it sort of exploded some myths about the church. Um, uh, but yeah, people were just shocked. Like I said, everyone knew of like, if you were Catholic you and you had gone to Catholic schools or whatever, you knew of a bad priest, but no one had any idea except for a handful of people within the church hierarchy of how bad it was. Uh -huh. And I don't think they considered it bad. I think they just sort of said, oh, yeah, we got a bunch of bad priests. We'll just keep moving them around and send them up a treatment. And um, some were. Some were really angry about it and were just like, we have to get rid of these people. But other people were like, oh, we're short of priests. We just, we'll just keep moving them around. It's a problem. You manage. It's a problem that you manage rather than. Yeah, something. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a problem that you manage. And we, we were, we're short on priests. If we, if we take Father Gagan out, then who's going to say mass at St. Thomas on Sunday? So we'll just keep him there. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was just crazy.
Yeah, and something you know, something that um, I believe it's it was it was the article from March um, uh, on the blowback and the sort of this this you know whether this would um, erode influence that a lot of people point out that you know the church really cares. It's what they they seem to they as they keep saying over and over again. Oh, you have to study so hard to be a church priest, and it's going to ruin their lives and everything like that. The church seemed to care a lot more. Uh, about the what this would do to the priests than what it would do to the priests' victims, um, and not only that, but you know there were some who pointed out the difference between how the church responded to uh, breaking rules around uh, gender norms uh, compared to breaking rules about, um, or, or I guess not norms, but the, the church dogma on gender roles than than the the, the priests' sexual abuse. So a nun who had baptized a couple of kids, right? And yeah. nuns aren't allowed to to um, to do the sacraments, to, uh, yeah, to, right. to carry yeah. out the sacraments, right? So then she technically should not have been able to do that. She was punished severely, right? What, what yeah. I can't remember. I can't remember what the punishment was. I don't either. But, I, you know, and the other thing was, if you were a priest and you were caught, like, dipping your hands in the till, you know, taking money, they punished you really severely uh, because that <laughs> sort of affected their lifeblood. But, you know, you abuse kids. Well, you know, we'll give you another chance. Yeah. It was a, yeah. Kind of a screwed up uh, dynamic. Yeah. That's pretty astonishing. Yeah. Well, so before I ask you questions about, uh, well, you know, what sort of a, uh, a final question about... Um, about advice for students who want to go into journalism. I, I would really love to get some questions from the students. Um, you have a, a, a real life uh, reporter and reporter, uh, journalism professor here, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and a, what do you call it if you star in a movie, but the movie was about you and you aren't, star, aren't the star? I don't know. I can't say you're a star of the movie, but star character in a movie, yeah. uh, in an Oscar winning movie. So let me just give you guys a chance to ask questions. They start yeah, they slow, but then once. they get going. <laughs> All right, well, I will ask my question and we'll come back to the student questions and give, give them a give it a chance to percolate. but. Um, I will ask my question about advice to young journalists. If you want, you know, do you have, do, I, I'm sure a good number of these students um, are thinking of about journalism uh, as a degree. Um, do you have, and, and as a career path, do you have some advice for young journalists? Yeah, be very, very curious. Um, every good journalist is just extremely curious about everything and always asking lots of questions. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of the things that, uh, my wife's family tells me to shut up sometimes because I'm just always asking questions. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, it just comes with the territory. I, you know, it's, you, you sort of, I think a, a lot of journalists kind of just are that way to start with. And then because of the profession, you just sort of push that, push it even more. Um, so you're just always asking questions. So you'd be very, very curious about everything. And what about, what, what about uh, in the classroom and in, um uh in 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 their next four years they're freshmen take lots of classes with you obviously yeah take lots of journalism <laughs> classes absolutely uh yeah and you know definitely um yeah definitely take some 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 writing classes of some kind if you want you know if you're interested in journalism take a journalism class take a j1 class which is beginning journalism writing um I, I certainly know a lot of people who did not go to journalism school who became great journalists. As, um, and actually, our department has a bunch of guys who were philosophy majors for some reason. But uh, the, you know, just take it, see if you think it might, you might enjoy it. Uh, journalism is a blast. It's so much fun because you get to write about all these really interesting situations because that's the job. And so you're sort of thrust into elections and catastrophes and just meeting really interesting people uh, or, or political elections. Um, you know, and it, it's just, you get to ask very impertinent questions of very powerful people because that's the job. So it's just really cool and really fun. Um, so yeah, so I, if you have any interest that way, I'm happy to chat with people. It really is fun. And anytime I've had an opportunity even to dip my toe into that universe, uh, I said to myself, boy, this is, this is more fun than my regular job. It really is. Uh, it really is fun. And I, I would say, you know, 
for students who are interested in science, or interested in engineering, or or possibly going um, in that direction, you know, there are joint degrees. The, any degree is good to for journalism. Really, yeah. there's no like, there's no degree that's better than others. There, any degree is good. Um, lots of joint programs, and and to work for um, uh, work for the campus newspaper. I, I, I tell you. You know, from the universities I've been around at, the Huntington News, it's the best student paper around of the ones that that I have seen. Um, you know, it's the only one that I, I, I go to for news. I really have um, uh, been keeping up on what's going on at the university around the pandemic based on um, uh, the reporting of the student newspaper. Yeah. So it's really good. Get involved. Absolutely. Uh, any other, any questions? For Professor Carroll? I'm going to answer one question that you haven't asked, but it's often asked of me, which was the, the scene where uh, I, put the, I put the stuff on the refrigerator about the, yeah. the, the House of Priests. So that um, was basically true. Actually, that was one of the things they desensationalized because Father Gagan, who was the subject of that first story, um, we were doing, before the story ran, we were doing what we call a deep dive on him, which is pulling out every bit of information we could. And I was at home and I was looking up his, the basics of where he lived and stuff. And I was like, oh, he lives on Pelton Street in West Roxbury. And I'm like, I think that's near me. And I pulled out an old paper map because that's the era. And I looked it up and it was literally around the corner. Matter of fact, I'm looking out the window now and I can't quite see Pelton Street sign, but it's like a hundred feet that way, just blocked by some bushes. It was really, really close to my house. And I went out the door just to see where he lived. And I was like, oh my God, he lives two minutes away from my house. And so the, I took a picture of Gagan and put it on my refrigerator and told the kids, if you see this guy, run the other way, which did <laughs> nothing but terrorize my poor kids who were like plus <laughs> sure. eight, six or something. Um, and uh, yeah, I was talking- A real to life like, boogeyman, like a, a real life- uh, Yeah, really. Uh, monster. Uh, yeah, they must have been terrified, but the alternatives are worse, so- Oh, yeah. way worse, yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember my daughter, who's now 29, and talking to her about it, and she was like, I had no idea what was going on, but I was so scared. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyways. Of yeah. course, I, when I watched the movie, um, uh, you know, when I, when I watched it at home, when it came out, you know, maybe the year after or whatever on, you know, on TV, um on amazon or whatever and um of course when i was watching that scene too i immediately wanted i didn't run out the door like you did but i of course immediately wanted to see where it was and i'm pretty sure i don't know if you've been by it but i'm pretty sure that the one that they shot it is on anawan yeah it's not I the same it house. Yeah. 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 yeah um because i when i saw it i said i know that house <laughs> um it's not on pelton yeah yeah, yeah. Well, if there are no questions, we can we can wrap it up. Um, I know it's Sorry, Thanksgiving. Uh, what, what movie yeah, is this? What movie is this you're talking you were talking about? Spotlight. <laughs> the movie is when Spotlight, you mentioned Daniel. And when you when you mentioned Pelton Street, I, I mean, sounds familiar. Look, I remember seeing that from a movie scene. I, I didn't watch no, the no, movie, no, but. The, movie, the Pelton Street is in the movie. I didn't remember it from a movie scene. I, in real life, I was looking up stuff about Gagan, and I, I realized he lived on Pelton Street, which is right around the corner from my house. So they they portrayed that fairly accurately in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great scene, too. It is a good scene, yeah. Uh, I mean, the acting in the movie is is phenomenal. It's For those for those who haven't seen it, I, I just, I highly recommend. I mean, I've, I assigned you the, the readings rather than the movie, but I did say the, mov the movie was highly, um, highly recommended. Yeah. Um, I, I think it just, it, I, I, you know, I was asked, I asked Professor Carroll about this, you know, about how, um, how accurate. Well, I, I, let me ask you now. I mean, how did you, do you feel it, it captured the spirit of things? It totally captured the spirit of things. They, and, you know, when they, when they came to us, they said, look, it's going to be a movie. It's not going to be a documentary. We're going to change some stuff to make it a movie to drive the plot forward or whatever. And so they did, but honestly, they did such a nice job of capturing stuff. I always sort of saw it as kind of a truthful fiction. So they combined a few characters, like uh, the guy you mentioned earlier in the bar scene, he was sort of an amalgam of a few people. Um, the uh, Robbie source who, you know, circles all the names. Uh, he was kind of an amalgam of a few different people too. Um, but it really, it, they did such a wonderful job in capturing the newsroom stuff, especially, I, you know, 
journalists love the movie. They just were like, this is great. This is what it's really like. It does such a fantastic job of capturing a newsroom. There was a funny interview with the, um, I forget the, what the actual name is, but the person who gets the, the, you know, the wardrobe person for all the, for all the actors. And they, they said, uh, they were interviewing her and, and they were like, um, the director kept coming to me and says, make the clothes look crappier, make the clothes look crappier. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> oh, anyway. they're dressed way too nice for journalists. They're way too nice, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> like you know, I I'm like I, I get my clothes at Costco or thrift shop. So you know, it's you know that's that's kind of really thing. funny. That's really funny. Yeah. So it's it's a wonderful wonderful movie, and I highly highly recommend it. Um, and I actually I remember reading with the director that he said that one of the motivations to to um, making the movie was actually less about exposing, you know, expose or, you know, focusing on that exposure of the Catholic church scandal and, and more about showing people the importance of local journalism, that it was, it was a movie he really wanted to highlight how local journalists are necessary to make change because this was something that was, um, and, and hold people accountable. This was something that was, um, uh, that was fading. Yeah, Tom, Tom McCarthy's the director. He's also an actor, and he was in a, a great television series called The Wire, which came out probably 15 uh -huh. or 20 years ago now. And uh, the, the Wire is, is set in Baltimore. Each year kind of follows a different institution. Uh, and one year, it, it follows the, uh, a newsroom, and Tom is a corrupt reporter in the newsroom. Um, and so uh -huh. that's where he got interested in journalism. Oh, so, I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know that at all. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I keep it's on my list. The Wire. I know it's, it's one of those shows. I know amazing. I need to watch it, but I haven't yet. It's just. I mean, you watch one, and you're like, you just got to watch everything. It's just so well done. It's. Uh, it's written by a guy named David Simon, who was a a reporter in Baltimore. Uh -huh. um, it's fantastic. It's just five seasons, and they're great. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it ties into our trivia. The our trivia for uh, for the week. All right, for this this beautiful mug right here. So the trivia question is this, all right? In the film, right, the scenes that were shot inside the newsroom, right, and inside the, the police station, right, where were those filmed, right? Where was the filming done? What was supposed to be inside the Boston Globe? And inside a local Boston police station at the beginning of the of the film, where were those shots? So that's the um, that's the trivia for this week. I also meant to mention that I have very exciting news. That um, so next Tuesday uh, we have Governor Dukakis, um, and Friday um, instead of discussion sections, we're going to have Professor Rod Brunson. Um, and speaking of spotlight, I'm actually going to add. Um, I'm going to add readings uh, for Professor Rudd. You're like, oh, great, readings uh, for Professor Brunson's um, uh, 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 class. Because I, I assigned his article that he co-wrote with a few people on, um, uh, on Boston Police Clergy Partnership uh, and its effectiveness. Um, so that's sort of an academic article, but I'm also going to assign the Boston Globe's recent-ish spotlight on race, um, which has an, a number of articles on race in the city of Boston. Right. But the, the premise is, is, is Boston a racist city, basically? And what are the problems with race um, in the city? So I'm going to, to give you something a little bit um, easier to digest the issues, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that on canvas too. Professor Carroll, you approve of that? That sounds great. Yeah, so um, so that's that's ne uh, next week. But the week after, right? The week after to close out the entire thing, I have a commitment from Kim Janey, who is president of the Boston City Council. She's also uh, the rep for Roxbury, where uh, the council for Roxbury, where Northeastern is. But she's the current president of Boston City Council, um, and she's going to come to our last class. Uh, and we're going to talk to her. So what I am going to do actually before then is I'm going to collect some questions from you, um, and um, and so that you can so that you can post to the city councilor about or the president of the city council about um, uh, Boston's current and future challenges. So I'm just I think that's like a really really exciting way to close out uh, close out the semester. So um, yeah, don't you don't want to miss that. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. 
Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to have a, a Gatorade right out front 36 uh, <laughs> <laughs> for you to pick it up and, and have a quick drink on Thank your Thank you ride. very much. Yeah. And, I don't run, I don't run um, that far. I don't have to worry about watering up too much. <laughs> well, you can never be too hydrated.